Sri Swetha's ten years of work largely has been about building ownership among citizenry and, and, and creating some kind of a accountability within the government because we're talking about a resource which is uh, largely the responsibility of the government to, to maintain both and in terms of quality as well as quantity but we've actually seen over years water as a resource has degenerated uh, and all across the country as in the situation is really really bad in the cities uh, more so in metros as if you look at Delhi or Bombay our, our rivers have turned black so Swetha's initiatives largely has been to work with both putting pressure on the government to really create that political will and work with the citizenry to really create some kind of an ownership that why do they need to really act to clean their water or save their water. When you look at these initiatives, when you look at asking people, when you solicit change both in behavior and action from people, the change is not immediate. Uh, so when we look at most of our initiatives, which is, which is looking at behavioral change that we solicit from people, uh, that directly or immediately does not have, a, have an impact on water quality. As in, you know, just because I've told someone, save water, that does not mean our water level, our groundwater table goes up in that area or in that school that I've just conducted a workshop. It's about creating a citizenry. It's about creating a gentry of people who really are bothered and understand that why are these resources important ecologically and economically. Uh, also, over, over 10 years, we put a lot of pressure on the government to really understand that, you know, they, perhaps they could live without a temple or without a road or with, without a caste politics, but with living without water is extremely, extremely difficult or near to impossible. So uh, our work, our investment, our initiatives all are around ground up need and desire and respect for water as a resource. When we talk about issues related to water, there are three main fold issues. One is water scarcity, second is access to water, and third is water pollution. Now, coming to the first point, which is scarcity of water, we are talking about shrinking water table. As in, you know, in, in nearby Gurgaon, water table has gone down tremendously in the last, last 10 years. The rivers have run dry. Most of the rain-fed rivers are dry even during monsoon in, in, in some, some areas. So we're talking about a great crisis, great water crisis in terms of quantity of water that is available for uh, human consumption, for drinking water and, and otherwise. Uh, the other is water access. When we talk about, because of problem number one, which is scarcity of water, uh, we're talking about uh, water being inaccessible for most of uh, the rural India and also for urban India. People on an average in, in most part of Himalayas walk to around five kilometers a day to fetch five or ten liters of water. So access to water, not just that in the Himalayas, but also in, 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 the, in, in main cities of India, we actually look at how, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, people have to spend uh, a lot of money and a lot of time to really get their minimum water and more so the poor people. So the impact of scarcity of water or access, the problem in access to water is more faced by the lower socioeconomic strata of people. And the third is water pollution because, of, again, as in water pollution leads to water scarcity and lack, to, lack of access to water. And uh, when we talk about pollution, uh, most of the rivers have turned black. Most of our underground water is contaminated. And, and mind you, in the case of uh, underground water contamination, these are irreversible damages. Surface water, when polluted, can perhaps still be treated because there are known sources of pollution and there's a, there's a point, there's a drain in question or there's a stream in question that could, have perhaps, that could perhaps be fixed. Uh, but when you talk about uh, underground water, when that gets contaminated, and we're talking about lead and mercury, uh, found in different parts of the country, not just in industrial areas, but in other parts of the country, it's an irreversible damage and because of which thousands and thousands of people do not have access to safe drinking water. The unfortunate part is that despite of that, some people do not have a choice but to have that as their drinking water. Safe or not safe does not matter. That water, that polluted water perhaps becomes a drinking water for millions of people and that is perhaps causing a lot of problem for health related issues uh, life expectancy and, and many other issues in different parts of the country. See, when we, uh, when we look at waste water, as we have to look at who creates, who manufactures that waste water, it's come from my house, your house, it comes every time you flush, that water goes 
and becomes wastewater. We are talking about industrial water as well. So we talk about two forms of municipal water and industrial water uh, being the main sources of water pollutants or water or wastewater. And of course, there's some bit of contribution uh, by agricultural waste also, as in the runoffs that we talk about that carry pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, all that could only be solved when there's a political will uh, at, at a larger level because you and I can only save that much. You and I can only put chlorine tablets in our water or maybe boil our, our water. We cannot boil a river. We cannot boil our underground, uh, you know, groundwater table. That has to be that fixing of responsibility and fixing of water issues needs to happen at an institutional level because citizenry as individual consumers cannot perhaps solve the problem. So, be it, be it government or be it an industry, someone has to take responsibility and come forward. Many of them could be problem creators because we also have to look at who pollutes. The polluter has to pay. The polluter has to really fix that, that entire problem at their end itself rather than make it, making it government's responsibility. So state, because sta it is state's responsibility, polluter, because that is their moral obligation towards drawing water. As in, and when we, when we look at safe drinking water, uh, as much as I would want my government to provide me uh, safe drinking water, as much as I would want to have the water straight from the tap, I know that the unfortunate reality is that I have to have an aqua guard. I have to have, have an RO. Or at an, at an institution level, I need to have a water treatment system. Ideally, I would have wanted the government to provide it because in a welfare state, in a democracy, in a country like India, which has, which has varied... Uh, kind of socio-economic profile that privatization is not a solution. Perhaps it's not a solution right now because it would only mean that people who can afford to pay, they would only have access to that safe water or access to that water. Uh, so the real solution lies with the government. And now government has to realize and think that what is the actual solution? Do they have a solution or do they actually need to engage a private company to treat the water? So I think both from localized action at an individual level, decentralized action on water treatment uh, is something that could be done by industry or ins institutions. And at a central level, at a centralized level, the government, the municipalities that are uh, run by the government, they need to really come on board. And maybe there are private bodies that perhaps need to bring in their technology, their, their, their know-how, and, and do something about it. As I said earlier, the cleanup is not happening. The, our rivers are still dirty because there's no political will. Uh, your question whether a private uh, body, a company can clean it and whether I would want them to come to my country uh, or to our country and, and do that act. Uh, well, we have, what we've seen globally is that a private company, uh, a corporation wants, is not there to do charitable activity. They're there to maximize profits. And that's the main fear. The moment you privatize actions like these, which is largely around maximizing profit than this entire do good of clean, clean our water resources, because that's not their motive, is there's a wider risk that you run. So it's okay for private companies to come, but that has to be facilitated by the government and not at the cost of common people, not at the cost of, of access issues, because we need to also understand that privatization means what? Privatization means paying more money, because that is what has happened globally in different parts of the world. Uh, where people had to pay extra money because their water body or their, uh, their so-called Delhi Jal board got privatized. So I'm a little wary about bringing in private bodies in an uncontrolled fashion, but we need to also understand that you know, we cannot wait forever and wait for the government to really clean it because government is just not doing enough and private, if let, let loose, they will only exploit the opportunity. Privatization is not a solution. Effic privatization not necessarily means efficiency, by the way. Uh, there is a lot of research that is there. There's a lot of R&D that private organizations have done, corporations have done. I think we need to really look at how can we create a win-win situation? How can the government and corporation look at water problem not as a business opportunity, opportunity, but as a social opportunity and perhaps shake hands and not look at it from a business point of view? If that happens, I'm for uh, private bodies coming and helping the government.